Well, good evening, everyone. My name's Robin Ewing, and with Michael Anderson, I co-direct the CREATE Centre. Creativity in research, engaging the arts, transforming education, health, and well-being. We're very excited to have um, tonight's presentation. It may not be tonight for you, it may be morning, afternoon, but we're very glad that you've been able to join us. Before we start though, we'd like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of our country. At the University of Sydney, we acknowledge and pay respect to the Gadigal land, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm joining you from Darug country. You might like to acknowledge and pay respect to the, to the land where you're joining from or Zooming from. I'd like to acknowledge as well that we have so much to learn from our First Nations Australians and indeed First Nations people all over the world who play story and the arts at the centre of their lives and their learning. They're doing, knowing, being, and becoming. We'd also like to acknowledge that in Australia, the land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And now I'd like to hand over to co-director, Professor Michael Anderson. Thanks, Robin. And I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, that I'm on Gadigal land today. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. This, uh, this webinar came out of uh, one of us at CREATE seeing this work and really wanting to hear more about it. And that's the exciting thing about these webinars, that we actually can hear more about work that kind of captures our imagination. Um, I've seen Punch Drunk's work uh, in New York and London and kind of been astounded by the inventiveness and the immersiveness of the work. And when I heard that it is, it was kind of being translated into classrooms or integrated or reimagined, I couldn't wait to hear what it was all about. So I'm so pleased to have uh, both Angela and Peter with us tonight. By the way, if you want to find out more about CREATE, here's the little plug. Thomas will put uh, the information in about how to become a member. It's free. Uh, and if you want to uh, share this video with someone after the live event, it'll be on the YouTube channel. And Thomas will also drop that in the chat box. So let's, uh, let's start with a quick introduction. Peter Higgin is Artistic Director of Punch Drunk Enrichment. Uh, he's Joint CEO uh, and Artistic Director of this charity that creates transformational theatre for education, community and family audiences. As a founder member of Punch Drunk in 2008, he established Punch Drunk's enrichment practice, taking the company's innovative approach into educational and community settings. Today, Punch Drunk Enrichment is an independent charity dedicated to creating experiences for as wide an audience as possible. And there's more about Peter's work that you can read uh, on the event website. And presenting with Peter this evening is Angela Colvert, who's Senior Lecturer in Education at the University of Roehampton in UK. Uh, she specialises in the co-design of games with and for children to support learning. Her current research focuses on the educational potential of transmedia storytelling and immersive theatre practices in school settings. And it's a special treat to have both of these presenters here tonight because I've read and admired Angela's work for, for a long time uh, and I've admired Punch Drunk's work for a long time. So I can't wait to hear about this chemistry of what happens when you bring uh, a fantastic academic and research mind together with the inventiveness, the immersion and the excitement of Punch Drunk. So I'll shut up and let that happen. So thanks very much, Angela, and thanks very much, Pete, Peter. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael and Robin, uh, for that kind introduction uh, to this presentation. And thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. Um, so as, uh, as we said, we're going to be talking about um, Punch Drunk Enrichment's 
Immersive Learning Collective. Um, and in particular, we're going to be talking about the relationship, the research relationship that we've developed um, and investigating how um, punch drunk enrichments work, shape both affective and effective playful pedagogies in schools through creative partnerships and co-design practices. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, that we, we are both able to be here today. Um, and I'm gonna hand over now to Pete, who's going to give an overview of um, punch drunk enrichment. Thanks, Angela. Um, good evening all. Good morning, Angela. Um, it's lovely to be here. Uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction um, and for the acknowledgement of land. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, it, it, it's brilliant to be here. It's great to be um, with, with colleagues today and to be able to talk about our work, to talk about this area of our practice and our research. It's hugely exciting for us as a project, albeit it's been slightly um, thwarted by COVID in recent recent times. Um, so Punch Drunk Enrichment is uh, has developed out of Punch Drunk's practice. I've been with the companies uh, uh, and with the practice since I graduated from university, uh, Exeter University in 2000. Um, and I helped found Punch Drunk with my colleague, um, Felix Barrett. Uh, and in between 2000 and 2008, I was a, um, I did all sorts of things, bit of TIE, bit of theatre and education, bit of performing, um, became a teacher myself and had the pleasure of taking my A-level students, 16 to 18 year olds, to see early punch drunk work. Um, things like the original Sleep No More, which was in a school in Kennington, um, which ran for two weeks, and then the Firebird Ball, which again ran for two weeks and was um, in an old pottery factory in Oval. Um, and I was really struck actually by what the immersion did to my students. Um, they were, a, you know, I was lucky to teach at a very nice um, school. Um, I had very engaged students, um, but their ideas of uh, theatrical presentation and drama were somewhat conventional um, and their enthusiasm for it was, um, was good, but not, you know, not, not as good as it could be. Uh, and, and what I found was when they experienced the, the work, they became really engaged and they became really engaged practitioners and they wanted whether or not they wanted to create immersive work or, or just their own work. They were profoundly moved by the work and they kept they kept speaking about it. And that was the thing that struck me. They did not stop talking about it. I taught on the Isle of Wight and we traveled, uh, which is an island off the south coast of the UK. And um, uh, we traveled into London and we would watch all sorts of different um, pieces of theater and by far and away, this was the thing that sort of struck them and that left them is what they were, they, they spoke about the most on the way home. Um, uh, so I knew something was going on with this practice and it wasn't until 2008 post productions like Faust and Mask of the Red Death, which really put Punch Drunk on the, on the map, that I got the opportunity to step sideways within the company and to kind of merge my practice as an um, educator uh, and my interest in um, the application of drama in other ways, it, and also my my love and my passion and my experience of um, punch drunk's practice, and that's really when the idea of punch drunk enrichment came about. And we, we, you know, in in terms of our work, what we're trying to do is to put audiences, to put teachers, to put uh, students, to put families, to put communities at the centre of an experience, and to make them active agents within a story. Um, and the challenge for me and the thing I love to do is to try and take our, the immersive practice and albeit the work I do and the work we do at the company might not take over huge um, buildings. What I try to do is kind of infuse that practice into a community setting or a school setting. So we, you can see on the slide here, we've got, um, you've got the Lost Ending Library, which is that picture with, um, uh, in, in the library there with the children sat on the floor. This is a library that pops up in a school over the weekend and where there was once a doorway to maybe the head teacher's office, a uh, bookshelf appears and the pupils have to work out why it's appeared and um, what their role in the story is. Next to that, you've got um, two students on tablets playing a game from our project, The Oracles, which was a cross-platform um, storytelling project, which took 
place across seven episodes, which happened both in a game world and in a physical set that we had in a, a village we constructed in a warehouse in North London. Um, and then bottom left, we've got a show for families. Um, they're called Against Captain's Orders. This was a project where we collaborated with the National Maritime Museum um, and created a show which took over their special exhibitions gallery and um, was a, essentially, audiences had a um, fantastical encounter with um, the museum stores, which we reconstructed as a labyrinthian sort of uh, backstage area of the um, museum. Uh, and in the bottom right corner, uh, we'll talk more about this type of work this morning, but you've got children there enjoying a project called A Small Tale, which is a teacher-led project, which arrives in a box and everything you need as a teacher to deliver an immersive project um, is in that box. And that project plays out over around a week for key stage one pupils, four to, um, no, sorry, um, five to uh, eight year olds. Um, and they are, um, they, they're essentially characters escape from a storybook and it's their job to um, try and uh, capture those characters and get them back inside that book. So um, yeah, that's a kind of very brief introduction in regards to our, our work and the sort of breadth and the, the, the scale, different scales of our work. I um, mean, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about how we're, um, how we're applying that to our immersive learning um, collective uh, initiative. Angela. Thanks, Pete. Thanks very much for giving that overview and the wealth of, uh, you know, projects, these fantastic projects that have been developing over, over the years. Um, one of the things I wanted to say um, and just highlight uh, about Punch Drunk Enrichment as well is their deep commitment to developing their practice and developing um, their work with schools. And this is reflected in the um, research that they have actually commissioned over the years, many of which, uh, you know, um, many of these reports are available on their, on their website, um, but they really do dig deep. They really do want to investigate, not only, you know, um, if it's working, but why is it working? How is it working? How can we, how can we improve? Um, always kind of looking to the next, uh, you know, the, the next innovation. And I've been very fortunate to be developing a research relationship with Punch Drunk Enrichment over a number of years. My, um, my work with them first began uh, with uh, an evaluation. I was part of an, a, a, a team with the Open University and we were commissioned to evaluate a project that was in a secondary school called Prospero's Island. Um, and what we were investigating um, is the impact of uh, punch drunk enrichments practice and approaches to uh, children's writing um, in school, but also um, the impact of their uh, professional kind of um, workshops for teachers and the impact that that would have on teacher practice within the school. So that's where it, it, it began. Um, but then in 2017, um, uh, Peter, uh, I started working as the lead researcher on uh, the project, The Oracles, which again, Pete uh, just uh, gave a quick summary of there. Um, this project was, um, so this was, a, as, as Pete said, a multi-sited immersive learning experience. Um, and it was developed for local primary school children in Haringey. And what the project sought to do was to investigate how gaming pedagogies might be combined with immersive theater to provide a range of learning opportunities for children as they played within and across a range of virtual and physical spaces. Now, although uh, Punch Drunk Enrichment had previously uh, integrated gaming principles into their work, the Oracles was the first time that digital gaming had been included in the form of a virtual world um, and, and incorporated into the virtual experience. And as you can see here, um, you can see some images here at the bottom of, a, of an installation and the, the uh, photo here of the, of the children playing a digital game in their classroom uh, is where the, where the game began, but then they were able to actually step inside, step inside this installation where, you know, actually you can embody actions. Um, the installation looked uh, the same as the game, uh, the game environment. It was a really exciting um, 
project to be a researcher uh, on. And as part of the project, uh, I developed a pedagogical model of immersive play for the company, um, which is now informing a long longitudinal study with 17 schools as part of their new initiative um, with the Punch Drunk Learning Collective. And again, you know, this was this was particularly exciting because with this research, um, what Pete asked me to do, it wasn't a, an evaluation, it was more of an exploratory study to really think about how do we articulate the practice? How do we understand not only how it works, but you know, what, what's the relationship between um, the practice and, and the impact on, on learning and teacher practice? So this research, the, the project that we're going to be talking about today um, is about the Punch Truck Learning Collective. And this is an ambitious three-year project exploring the application of punch drunk enrichment practice in schools over three years. And teachers and schools are meeting regularly with punch drunk en enrichment practitioners to deliver new projects, uh, to learn and apply principles in their school and to share knowledge with their peers and also the wider sector. So we've just completed the first year uh, and it was actually extended. We had a 1.5 as well, didn't we, Pete, because uh, of COVID. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but teachers and schools are being taken on a journey in this project with the ambition to equip them to become experts in immersive learning techniques and approaches. And we're exploring what immersive learning teaching is, how it can be sustainably embedded uh, within school life and looking at the impact on teachers' practice uh, and pupils' engagement and also achievements. So my primary focus here as a researcher is I'm investigating the role of the teacher as creative practitioner. Um, I am looking at it in, um, the creative partnerships and what you'll see later on is that actually, yes, uh, the teachers are developing their practice as part of this um, project, but actually so are Punch Drunk Enrichment. It really is uh, kind of an exchange of knowledge and ideas. So um, Pete, shall I uh, just hand over to you again, just to give, give you about who's involved and who we're working with? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll just say in terms of the, uh, the work we're doing with these 17 schools, um, it's really grown out of the witnessing the impact of our practice within school settings and seeing what schools do after we leave and hearing schools wanting to continue the practice and to try and continue that to sustain um, that level of engagement with their pupils. And we um, have operated for man many years, we, we don't now, but we operated for many years, kind of uh, jumping from borough to borough in around London and, and working with, with different boroughs for or, or delivering maybe one or two projects. Um, and what we've done over the last five years is really um, looked at extending our offer and looked at the journey we can take a school on and part of what I really want to do with this research is at, to really really understand how we can sustainably, sustainably embed immersive practice within teaching and actually um, knowing that this is powerful uh, how do we then extrapolate what we need to to then to, you know to, to impact how teachers might be trained um, and to see if we can develop models for teachers to be able to access this practice without really necessarily ever having to access the bigger work we do, which might be restricted because of geography um, uh, and because of funds. So we're working with 17 primary schools and broadly speaking, we're working across five London boroughs, Haringey in the north uh, of London, Greenwich in the southeast, Lewisham southeast, um, Tower Hamlets in the east and embarking in Dagenham in the east and these represent schools with which um, we've had um, a different type of relationship over the years um, and I'll mm -hmm. leave Angela to talk to that a little bit more. Yeah thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah so um, we, as Pete said we are um, working with these, these five London boroughs um, and the schools within those and what's really exciting and unique about uh, this Punch Drunk Learning, um, you know, the Immersive Learning Collective with Punch Drunk Enrichment is that there is a sliding scale of experience amongst members. So some of the schools have very, uh, are really familiar uh, with the work of Punch Drunk Enrichment. You know, some of them, in fact, I think one of the schools, maybe even two, have been with you uh, right from the start, you know, those really, really, you know, 
right from the beginning and I've almost uh, I was in one um, punch truck learning collective meeting and actually uh, the, the artists ask people sort of line up but almost as a, a, a literal sort of physical scale you know placing yourself uh, in, in relation to experience and yes right at the uh, right at the sort of one end uh, we had te uh, a teacher here who had undertaken every project um, with with the school and um, at the other end of the scale um, we had uh, you know teachers who were coming to this for the first time um, through the Punch Drunk Learning Collective. Um, and there are also some, you know, in, in the middle who have had some experience. So um, some of the schools that uh, were involved with the Oracles, for example, joined the collective um, and were building on, on, on their experience of that. So um, what we've tried to do in the research is to ensure that we are uh, yeah, including uh, teachers with a range of experience of Punch Drunk Enrichment's practice so we can understand um, how this is uh, embedded in a range of school settings. Um, right, so, I think, yeah. oh, is it me or you, Angela? Uh, go ahead, yeah, go give us, a, give us an overview, please. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. so I think, um, and just say we're on that, Angela, also, there's a, there's a range of teachers as well. Of course, the school may well have been involved with us for, um, you know, the last 10, 12 years, but, you know, they've got teachers who are coming in who are brand new to teaching or brand new to that school. So there's also that sort of, you know, churn, that natural churn that you get within a setting. Um, so, yeah, in terms of where we're at at the moment, um, year one has, has, has passed um, and it obviously took uh, us slightly longer because of COVID. Um, but th what, what happens generally, the sort of the, the work we'll do um, with, with the schools are we have we have termly meetings. Where we come together where we aim to share creative practice and where we aim to um, update on on what's been happening in schools so we share our practice we share their practice and we all share something around what we're what the theme is for that year to help inspire teachers and actually what we're finding is that we're giving teachers a space to be creative and a space to have a peer um sort of you know an area where they can come together as peers um each year we'll um we'll create a brand new project for the um, collective uh, in the first year we created a project which was for key stage two um, seven to eleven year olds and it was initially named codename atlantis its title has changed but more on that later we will also offer a full day um, or up to a full day of continued professional development um, for those running the new project and we'll offer a whole school um, inset uh, in service education training um, session for the schools as well around the theme uh, of what we're doing and, and year one was about our, our principles. Thank you. Um, and, and the principles, Pete, in that first year, um, you were discussing, weren't you, with, with, uh, with uh, Tara, um, also a um, member of Punch Drunk Enrichment, that what, what would you focus on first of all? And um, we wanted to, to uh, have an opportunity to share two of the foci, um, rituals and myths. And these are two core uh, kind of ideas um, and, and they're, they're both core to your practice. So um, Pete, I wonder if you could just say a little bit about um, moon juice. Uh, some people may not have ever heard of moon juice, might not know what moon juice is, and it's a very important tool, isn't it? I think <laughs> in the, for, many, for, for many teachers now incredible incredibly powerful elixir um no no we, we're focused on riffs riffs myths and rituals sorry uh, in the first year um and moon juice actually was something that came out of our first ever um project in a primary school which was called under the eider down which was set in a magical bric-a-brac shop where the items within the shop came to life when the um sun went down um and within that uh project we we're exploring all the many facets of our practice and we we're always looking at trying to bombard the senses and we were thinking about taste and we were thinking about because all projects also have a you know an aim to um, benefit the curriculum and this one was all about storytelling and imagination and we we're like how could we imbue a, um, a sense of imagination how could we create um, this sort of sense of wonder and the sense that you we could give them something to um, embolden their imagination and we we gave every child who came and visited that project a cup of moon juice, which was a, uh, a drink which is um, made from the story waters of the moon. Um, and we created a ritual of drinking that drink and then 
um, you know, allowing that to um, embellish and to embolden imagination, uh, which um, actually, you know, was part of that project. And what we didn't realize at the time was how much that would then go on to be part of the school life uh, or part of life in school. And I, I talk to teachers now who, who are some of those foundation schools who've been with us for a long time with pupils who don't even know um, what um, the bric a brac shop <laughs> project was, but they still use moon juice. So they use that ritual of drinking this um, drink, which has been um, given the significance, given this sort of, and this ritual of coming together and drinking it. And um, so we were thinking, what, you know, we were thinking what's, what's core, what a core part of our practice is ritual and actually use ritual in our, um, in any, any rehearsal room as well. What's our core ritual for a, a, a show we're creating or production we're creating or a project we're creating. Um, and so we, 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 you know, we started to get the, the teachers thinking about rituals and thinking about what are the very small things they could do to begin to, begin to think about immersive practice. And alongside rituals, we also talked about myths. Um, and you can see here, and the myth of creating a creature, and this is part, this was a photo from one of our collective meetings, um, and a lot of the practice that my colleague Tara Boland has been developing on behalf of Punch Drunk in Richmond over the last five or six years is teacher-led practice. So how do you make work that is much more light touch and much more, um, you know, about reimagining stories within the school space with the school setting as opposed to transforming and a space wholesale um and at all in in terms of all of our projects there's a myth there's a myth of you know in a small tale we've got two little people uh, a bad magical book where if you leave it open to the little characters within there will escape um the lost ending library a magical fantastical library that jumps around the world from place to place and can um, appear in your school overnight and will, a door will be replaced for a bookshelf to um, a lot of the work we'll talk about later, which um, a signature of Tara's um, is, uh, you know, creating mythical creatures who escape and run amok around the school. And um, as, a, as a school and as a class, you need to kind of capture them. Um, so we, we've always, we're always creating myths and we're always creating a backstory in the logic of a project. Because you know earlier I talked about that. How do you um, how do you place the audience as active agents within the the piece? Where you, and how do you fuse the practice with a, an organisation or a setting? And you just have to think about um, you have to think about a reason for why this project will happen, and you have to think about a reason for why this project um, needs uh, the, the the people who are in that organisation or setting. And in this instance, that's um, young people and teachers. So we, we create a mythology around the projects, um, which we try to bring to life and make as real as possible. Yeah, so thanks. we're exploring and myths just, and rituals. Yeah, thank you. And just to sort of add to that before we move on to the next bit, I just wanted to say as well, and we were talking about this a bit later on, is that the teacher insets, the training sessions and the immersive learning collective meetings were very pl playful. They were experiential. Um, and you can see here that actually what teachers were we're doing with, uh, uh, with, with the with the artists we're thinking about what resources do we have to have you know to hand looking at the environment uh, around them within the school and thinking what are the small changes that we could make to to transform that space um to bring uh kind of play, playful purpose uh to to the learning and um you know all schools have rituals uh, you know uh, as part of daily day-to-day -day practice but what we're talking about here is this kind of you know this playful imaginative immersion into into a story um through 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 ritual and through the creation of myths uh, sorry is that i just wanted to add that because i think that's that was something really uh, really uh, powerful i think about the, the the meetings and as i say later on this had an impact on practice giving teachers something a small starting point was important. Um, so, Pete, yes, if you, uh, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to you again. But uh, this was a uh, this, as we said earlier, um, as part of Punch Drunk's uh, immerse, uh, enrichments um, offering, uh, there was a new uh, 
a pilot, uh, a game that was developed called Codename Atlantis. And Pete, I'll, I'll let you explain how this developed. Yeah, so my, my colleague Tara worked on this and it was, um, it was then, we, we basically, we created a teacher-led project called A Small Tale for Key Stage 1. And then we went, oh, we can do one class, let's do a whole school. <laughs> so then we created a project called The Miniature Museum, which was for a whole school. Um, and then we came back and we started the Immersive Learning Collective. And each year what we want to do is, is, is um, use the collective to uh, we want to model what we'd consider best practice so we want to share our practice um, and we um, will want to involve teachers in the journey of a project so actually the beginning of this project started uh, when we were doing our collective meeting slightly more informally but before we'd actually launched the project um, uh, the immersive learning collective project and um, actually we were thinking about the environment we were thinking about how could we use our practice to, uh, to tell a story <clears throat> which might you know, make children reflect on their own environments and also on um, on, on the wider issue of um, you know climate change in a in a very sort of small and fantastical way. Um, and we came up with the idea of Codename Atlantis. And one of the things we always want also wanted to do um, was uh, to create something which started as a game. Um, so we went a little bit Stranger Things on this and it, um, we were wanted to sort of have this board game that came to life in your school. So we had this idea of Key Stage 2, sort of the, the upper end of the primary um, school age group and th this idea of this game that came to life and manifested itself around the school. Um, so we, we began to work with the teachers at the very beginning of the year. We, 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 we introduced the... Um, the game Code Atlantis um, and then over the course of the year they trialled it and we got feedback from them and we observed it in action uh, and um, and then reiterated from that point so there's very sort of active collaboration and really having a sort of steering group of teachers um, mm. and here you can see a, a bunch of our teachers from across all of the different schools um, when they're yeah, when, with their first encounter of Codename Atlantis at an Immersive Learning Collective meeting. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the, yeah, I think we'll flip on to the next slide, um, Angela. Um, so, yeah, alongside the board game as a physical asset, we also created a, um, a sort of pretty shonky website, which um, housed information on a little known board game called The Lost Island of Dust. So we really try with anything we're doing, trying to make it feel as real as possible for the children. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute nightmare for our comms department because we never want to say that we've made a project because we want the children to believe it's real. We never want to say to the pro children, we're part of Shrunk in Richmond and we just delivered that magical project to you because we're immediately kind of um, tearing down, you know, revealing the backstage. So um, we, we but we created a, a website really to kind of give a reality to this myth, to reinforce this myth. Um, so here we are, we've got, in terms of gameplay, um, I won't go into the, the project in, in, in loads of detail. You can see that the way, the way it um, develops over day, in day, days one to six. Um, and, but essentially what happens with this project is they play this game and really they probably should never have played the game and the teacher should have left it in the, um, in the bric-a-brac shop, which they found it in. Um, and the game comes to life, a character escapes from the game, and it is their job not only to save the character, but also to save the island, the lost island of dust. So what becomes apparent uh, within the mythology of the piece is that um, the lost island of dust is kind of, it is a story really, which is a parallel to our um, world whereby, um, you know, in the game, you play a game where you're trying to stop certain areas of the um island turning into dust so this idea that you know we're in a world at the moment which is heating up and at the extreme end of the heating up of the world the the it burns and, and it literally turns to dust and um everything's destroyed so the, the they play a game where they're trying to kind of work collaboratively collaboratively to kind of spread resource and save the island um and in the end they don't it turns to dust a, a character escapes and then they spend the next um, week or so after this series of six days um, finding evidence of this character around the school and understanding that they need to um, to save her they need to play the game again and they need to do a number of things in um, in and around their school. 
And yes, that, that is such a whistle stop tour of it. It doesn't, yeah. it, there's, there's no, it doesn't do justice, it. but no, absolutely. We can't, we can't possibly, uh, you know, kind of go into it in, in detail, but um, there is more information about what it has become on the website that, that we can point you towards afterwards. Um, but just to say as well, um, I'll be coming on to this a bit later on, but you never see the character, right? But you never see them. It's all about transformation of space. Yes, uh, yes. And it's, it's all about creating those spaces for imaginative engagement. And the other thing to say as well is that, yes, you know, it, it, it is uh, concluded at the end, isn't it? It, it all comes right <laughs> at the end um, through the children's participation. And I think that's something, again, that runs through, um, you know, as Pete said, it runs through lots of their work, is that the, the children are uh, active participants. They are moving events on through their actions, through their decisions. Um, so, so this is sort of, it's get, there's lots of kind of elements of game in here. Uh, you've got the board game, but you've also got the play that emerges, uh, you know, in the environment, in the classrooms. Um, and I'll be talking about that a bit in a, in a moment. Um, so Pete, is there anything we want to say about this? Shall I move on now to, to um, what we were looking at in terms of the research? Um, so in terms of the, uh, what we were investigating with research, we're thinking about how are conceptualizations and practices of immersive play co-constructed and enacted by participants? So we're looking at pedagogical practices, how um, the work of obviously punch drunk enrichment uh, merges and um, informs the work uh, of, of, the, of the teachers in schools with school practices. Um, and you know, obviously building on um, you know, working creative partnerships. Uh, by um, Thompson et al thinking about you know, these signature pedagogies that actually um, artists uh, uh, such as Punch Drunk Enrichment um, artists have ways of uh, knowing and being. Um, and, and similarly in schools, there are ways, there are these default pedagogies, there are practices that go on on day to day. And so we're you know, drawing on some of the work that Thompson et al have, have developed there and thinking about what that looks like in this, in this work. Um, also, we're looking at the process. This is very much because we are working with over, uh, teachers over three years, there's a real opportunity here to think about the process of pedagogical development. Um, and we're looking at how immersive play, and we are framing it as play in classrooms, supports an understanding of operational, critical, and um, cultural dimensions of learning and literacies. And again, this is drawing on the work of Bill Green, um, his pedagogical model, looking at uh, operational, not just skills, but also how teachers, artists make cultural connections and what critical questions arise during, um, during, the, during the work. And lastly, um, looking at, at the, because we are looking at how, you know, sustainability and, 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 and what this looks like um, going, going ahead into the future, we're thinking about the affordances and the challenges of developing playful pedagogies in classrooms across a range of settings. So, uh, we know that you know that the projects will look different in different schools um, because of a range of factors. So we, we're looking at those as well. Um, as Pete said, we had 17 schools who are um, engaged in the um, immersive learning collective. Um, they are um, involved uh, in the research. Um, many as non-case study schools, but we also have three case study schools that we selected again to be um, sort of representative or to, to span um, that sliding scale of experience that we mentioned earlier. So we had one school that was very familiar, the senior leadership was very experienced um, with Punch Drunk Enrichment's work, one that had only joined, uh, had been involved with the Oracles project, but was keen to find out more and one, uh, one school that was very, very new to, to the approaches. So, um, what, we, what I did is I've been gathering observations um, of the meetings, um, also classroom sessions I've been in, uh, observing uh, play as it, it emerged in the case study schools, um, and also undertaking interviews with artists, children, um, teachers and senior leaders. And that's one of the things that um, is really important and central to the way that um, we've been constructing the research is that, uh, you know, having those multiple voices um, is very, very important to build a full picture. Um, also, uh, teacher reflections and field notes. So um, teachers have been reflecting on the punch, uh, immersive learning um, collective meetings. Um, and also they, they um, I asked the, the teachers that I was working with in the case study schools to um, actually uh, reflect on three children in particular in their classrooms and um, consider sort of the impact of their, their, their uh, their work on, on the children's learning. Um, 
as I said earlier, this is um, building, this research is uh, building on and extending and redeveloping in many ways the model of immersive play that I developed with um, uh, for Punch Drunk as part of earlier research. Now, there isn't time to go into it all now, um, but you, know, you can uh, take a look at the report for oracles if you want to find out more. But what I will be pulling out um, are, are sort of some key ideas um, that underpin the, the, the research that we're, we're undertaking. So one of the things um, that, that, was really, that, that, that was really important um, is to, to think about um, the work is to think about why, what, what you know, really unpack what's happening. So, when I undertook the Oracle's research and developed this model of immersive play, it became very clear from the accounts of participants that the intensity of the experience was impacting on their engagement, but also that there were several aspects of the affective, how it felt. Um, there were several aspects that were actually. Um, inflecting with what we could observe, you know, this, this, this engagement, the effect on children's learning and on teacher practice. Now, um, uh, Josephine um, Mason has uh, said, you know, pulled this out in a, in a previous report that actually punch drunk enrichment's work is felt as much as it is un, uh, as it's understood. And I think this is something that really um, I reflected on when developing this. Um, the effective elements of um, Punch Drunk's work are that participants feel a sense of purpose. There's an impetus behind it, which is framed by these myths, um, as, as Pete said. But there's also a sense of urgency. There's an, there's an imperative, you know, that this must happen. These, uh, you know, things must be put to right. But also um, the sense of space, this idea of, of, of changing spaces and how that feels and how that um, to, to participants and a sense of community. And, and all of these aspects are linked to not only cognitive understanding, so how these are understood, but how they are physically embodied. So there's a physical aspect to it and, and also a, an emotional um, element too, which I'll, which I'll pull out. So in, in previous work, I've talked about a flow of knowing what the work is, uh, is about, uh, a flow of feeling the emotion and a flow of, of, of a physical um, feeling as well you know what it feels like to be in space and, and how that changes over time um so what i'm going to do uh is 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 pull out some of this um and and how this uh informs the, the the structure of the research so first of all this model of um immersive play was integrated into um the the offering for teachers so it, it was um integrated into the immersive learning collective meetings, but also to the school trainings as well. So in that respect, it was a pedagogical tool um, and was used in the initial inset to frame teachers' reflections on the um, educational potential of um, Codename Atlantis, sorry, in the immersive learning collective meetings. So it can be translated really simply into questions that you might ask yourself anyway when you're planning. You know, why, when, where, who, how, what, um, and these are questions that teachers are asking themselves uh, all the time when they're planning, but actually what we're looking at is how um, punch drunk enrichment's, pra enrichment's practice um, can transform these questions. In the uh, inset, for example, um, it was integrated uh, in a way which en enabled teachers to consider how punch drunk enrichment's work makes the familiar strange. So even something as simple as um, asking teachers to enter the room, Pete, I remember, you know, uh, that, in that as soon as teachers enter the room, you're already kind of pulling out some of these ideas. So, so why? Um, so you, you, you're, uh, you frame the, the, the purpose of the meetings and you give them a time limit for entering. You change the space by um, playing music or the way you set out chairs. Um, and in terms of the community, we're thinking about reflecting on um, who is engaging with this work, you know, thinking about who you're working with and the practitioners that are working um, with each other. Um, so as well as being a pedagogical tool, um, it has also been applied here as an analytical tool to consider how the principles of immersive play were uh, constructed and enacted during the, um, the the Immersive Learning Collective. And it resonates very much with um, some of Pink's work on sensory ethnography, um, thinking about relationships between bodies, minds, materiality of spaces, and the, sens uh, and the sensory and nature of the environment as you're gathering data. So 
with Codename Atlantis, I'm just going to focus on um, give you give you a sense of some of the the voices of participants as we go through, and um, pull out. Um, how, what I was observing, what I was trying to uh, kind of tune into during the research. So as I said earlier, this idea of a, a sense of, of purpose, um, this can be understood, you can see here that we've got uh, the cognitive understanding of aims. So do, do children understand uh, the purpose? But also, as I was in classrooms, I was observing um, how they enacted this purpose. So, you know, when they gr grouped together around an object, for example, as they interacted with the space. Um, and teachers also commented very much on the emotional, their affinity with the aims. So how much did they, they identify and care about the purpose was very important. So we have a teacher here at one of the meetings and I'll read it aloud just to give you a flavor of, uh, of, of, of um, their reflections. When they got the email back from Asha, who put the website together, they lost their minds. They couldn't believe it. And they were like, we need to help Asha. It was brilliant. Getting someone from outside really engaged them with a purpose that we have to help now, and we're going to use that going forward. We're going to get someone from the outside to come in to give the children a purpose for doing what they're doing. Um, and this was this, the teachers reflecting on how this uh, this this uh, framing in, in, in punch enrichment's work of giving this fictional purpose to the learning um, was was something that the children um, really identified with. And another teacher in an interview said they really felt that they were the link to her being saved. Um, they, they you know they understood the the significance of what they were that what they were doing. In terms of the sense of place. Um, as uh, Pete said um, earlier, and we were talking about, you never actually see the characters um, that have emerged from the board. Um, they, it is all, all, all suggested through um, changing the spaces in which the children and the teachers are working with them. So in terms of the, the, the understanding, um, children were um, asked to think about the, the maps of the school environment, sort of thinking about uh, where things should be and, and, and noticing when things weren't in the right place. Um, we were thinking about the 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 the, the uh, pathways as well, the physical uh, environments, and teachers were actually actively, uh, you know, placing objects in unusual places. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about um, how spaces were used. But um, there was a real kind of emotional. Uh, we also thought about sort of the emotional impact of changing spaces on children um, and children's learning. So one of the teachers said there were things that we would never normally do, like go around the school and take them to parts of the school that they're not normally allowed to go into usually, looking at the space a bit differently. And um, this is really, a, again, something that was very powerful that, for example, if we think about the emotional associations and memories of a teacher's a head teacher's office, when would a child normally go into a head teacher's office? Well, it might be, you know, quite sort of depending on the head teacher uh, and depending on the, on the relationship, they will have particular associations about when they've been in there before. And it'd probably be for an official reason, um, or it may be to share some work or, you know, so, uh, you know to celebrate some work that they've done. Um, but in this project, uh, they were actually needed to go into the teacher's office because it had been disrupted. This character that had emerged from the board had completely disrupted the teacher's office. The head teacher was very cross, wanted to know what was going on. Um, and so this idea of the emotional associations of that space um, were, were, were kind of drawn upon here. And actually um, teachers said that, you know, long after the event, um, children would still sort of remember the time that they had to fix, fix the office. Um, we also looked at this idea of the sense of urgency. So um, this idea that there was a time constraint. So um, when children were coming into class, one teacher commented, he was always the first in the door and racing in the morning, asking what's changed. There was this sense of anticipation, this emotional anticipation day by day about what was going to be new, what was going to happen next. But there were also um, some interesting data, sort of interesting data that we gathered about um, the resources that were used to, to give this sense of agency. So one teacher said um, there, there was a candle that had been included in the design. And the candle was included to suggest that as the candle, the candle would burn down day by day. Actually, the, the teachers were given several candles, but it looked like it was burning down day by day. And it was to sort of signal that time was running out for this character that they needed to save. 
but the children didn't really get the reference of the candle burning down. That to them didn't signal a sense of urgency. So, t so um, Tara uh, Boland, you know, took us on board, and actually, that's been sort of designed de designed differently now in the new iteration. But there was this kind of uh, discussion. There was this real kind of iterative design going on between the teachers and the the um, the artists, thinking about these interpretations of the resources that were being created. Um, and the children too really did keep a note of what was going on. So this whiteboard here is um, an example of a child using a whiteboard to make a list of what was happening on day one, day two, day three. This was not instigated by the teacher. This was this this was these were this was uh, came from a child thinking, come on, th th there are things happening. Let's see what's let's see see what's, you know. Let's like, keep a note of what's happened over the days. Um, so we can decide what we need to do next. So there was a sense of time running out that kept that kind of um, urgency going. A sense of community was also present. Um, the teachers reported that they really believed that they'd caused it to happen, that they caused this, this, this chaos, I think, you know, in the school to, to happen. It, it didn't just appear for them. It was like we played the game and caused it to happen. So it was quite different. They felt a sense of responsibility, I think, and wanted to put it right. Um, but also we can think about community in terms of school communities. So um, the teachers said, you know, I do think the other people involved in it really helped, like my teaching assistant. I do worry about how I would have managed with the setup without an extra adult in my room. And of course, the buy in from the head teacher and the librarian. And there was this sense that the sense of community, they were creating a sense of community in the class. They were sort of uh, engaged in this, this project together, but also um, they were working across the school. So uh, the head teacher, for example, was part of play. Uh, the librarian helped with the setup. And so, you know, this was an important part actually of making sure that this was a success um, and, and worked well. Um, so that's something we're reflecting on going forward. And also this sense of loyalty. If we think about um, emotional belonging and achievement, there was a real sense of lo loyalty amongst the children. Uh, you know, they didn't want the teacher to get into trouble. And, and it kind of uh, really, there were some really interesting um, discussions between teachers and children about what should be what should be done. There was interesting dilemmas being discussed about the next steps. Um, so those those two um, aspects, those that's just to give you a, a flavour of some of the affective aspects. This idea of the sense of purpose, urgency, space, and community. Um, how this felt, not in terms of how children and teachers understood this, but also in terms of the physical space themselves moving in and out of unfamiliar environments, for example, um, and also thinking about you know how it felt the emotional engagement. But an important question for us and an important question for Punch Drunk Enrichment is what is the effect of this on um, teacher practice, on teacher learning? You know, this is um, this effective engagement does actually have observable effects, um, which can be classified um, in a number of ways. So thinking about constructing stories, tackling challenges, this idea of performing belief, suspending disbelief and reshaping relationships with each other as well, identity, taking on learner identities, teacher identities, for example. So I'm gonna take uh, you through a few of these now, and again, just giving you a flavor of some of the teacher voices. I do have more data to draw on, but I just wanted to stick to sort of one set here of teacher voices. Um, so one teacher said um, about, creating this story, this myth together. That's what we're focusing on here. This myth of anarchy, the name of the character is anarchy. During one session, the teacher said, someone went into a really visual description of anarchy. And then because there had been some feathers left, we were debating over the significance of those. And in the end, someone said, well, maybe she's a winged creature. We don't know that she's human. And actually anarchy was created just through changes of space. You never saw her. There were, um, you know, there were artifacts that were left, but also you got a sense of her character because there was chaos involved. So, so children were having to infer and deduce what the nature of this character was, what the intentions were. And what was interesting over the course of this um, project was that um, teachers did found this uh, project was a, an opportunity to open spaces for sort of free discussion and dialogue. Um, one teacher said it was open ended so that children were able to speculate and create their own story about what had happened with delicate interjections, really, about how it could divert, develop further, uh, further to, you know, keep that pace going. But again, that open ended opportunity for the children to decide 
you never know where it's going to go. Um, and this is this is something um, significant about process, actually. And this is something that we're looking into the into the second year. We'll talk about in a moment. But this idea of of noticing uh, learning as it emerges um, links to drama practice as well. Um, you know, in, in relation to having the skills to be able to tune in to the learning and 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 to 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 adapt um, based on children's suggestions. Um, and so th this was interesting. And and and. In terms of writing, there was lots of writing um, that, that came out of this, but it wasn't always planned. So, um, you know, uh, Teresa Kremin et al. talk about, you know, seizing the moment to write in drama. And that was something we observed um, here that um, actually they wanted to write a letter to the to anarchy. They very much wanted to communicate and ask and say, we're going to help you. Um, so there was letter writing that emerged sort of in the moment. Um, you saw some um, some whiteboards there. Children said, we've got to write this down. We've got to note this down. Um, there were other whiteboards where, which were filled with locations. Where have we seen evidence? Where is she going next? And this was important, um, I think, um, in terms of sort of thinking about not only planned opportunities for writing, but those, those that emerge. Um, the second sort of effect, as it were, the second sort of observable um, outcome we've got here is about performing belief. Um, and uh, this is about uh, buy-in, really, uh, you know, in a very sort of short, short term. So uh, here we have an interview uh, with a teacher with the year six children saying, I don't think they were completely believing it, but I think they wanted to, and they enjoyed being part of it. The website did work really well for them because some of them went home and checked it out and they were like, we thought you'd made it, but when we went home, it was really real. And this, another teacher in a meeting said, they need that, they need that link with their everyday life. Mine don't play board games. So the website, it made it real. Um, and in my previous um, work, you know, I, I've, I've looked um, extensively about, you know, the significance of, of this kind of um, believability, the reality of, of um, integration of digital technologies into, into learning. And here the website was really important for the children. Something as simple as a website and email um, made, made this something that they wanted to um, engage in. Um, I'm going to um, stop for a moment because I, um, my, my, my battery could, um, Pete, could you just take over for a moment while I plug in just to talk about um, the website, perhaps the website um, design and also maybe as well about how important it is to Punch Drunk's work, this idea of believing, you know, that actually the teachers are performing belief. I just need to play. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm conscious of time as well, Angela. So I think we may we will we'll may, may zip through a few bits here just to give time for um, discussion. Um, you know, of course, I think what was interesting about the website was it, it did reinforce that reality. Um, and of course, this age group were key stage two. They're, they're getting to the more cynical end of the spectrum. Um, so to be able to make it real and to be able to kind of it, you know, to from, to make that leap, as it were was important and I think the other thing here was this, the teacher uh, teachers had control of the inbox and had control of the email so they could actually um, communicate with the pupils via this um, via this fictional character so they were in, in, in a sense performing as well and actually having that um, a guise that felt really real that they could they could actually you know, put on the hat of Asher the game designer also led to all sorts of different things and um, allowed them to um, flex the narrative um, so I will uh, move on very quickly. Thank you, Pete. So in terms of tackling challenges as well, this was something that really um, came out from the research that um, because there was this purpose behind the learning, um, it was really important that they that they solved the, 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 the problems um, and that they, the, it, this intersected with this sense of space as well. They started to look and find clues um, everywhere as they as they as they went around. Um, in terms of identities, um, we talked about this, that, in, um, that teachers were thinking about themselves as well, their role of teachers negotiating this. So the teacher was saying, at times I could have given each table a little purpose if everyone had a role, like a reciprocal reading where someone reads aloud and someone analysed, but I could have done something like that, but I didn't want to take the independence away from them. So one of the things that they were thinking about is thinking about how actually some of the practices that they may have already, may have previously done, they thought, actually, I'll try something new here. Um, and this was part of wanting to give the learners, uh, you know, thinking about learner identity and about their agency. Um, and teachers learned a lot about, they, they reported learning a lot about children and their learning um, styles here. We've got 
um, a teacher saying that they, they learned a lot about the social constructions and the difficulties that happen for children. So all of these um, intersected um, in the research and they are um, elements that we're, we're drawing out. Um, and as I say, this did feed into the vanishing lands, which is now the newest, uh, newest, this is what it became, isn't it, Pete? Yeah, no, so the code name Atlantis, um, after it had a fairly large overhaul, uh, after the sort of teacher feedback, a lot, a lot of the teacher feedback fed into it, and it was everything from, you know, believing the, you know, the believability of the candle, um, to also us reflecting on the game, the board actually um, cost too much to make, and it was also quite small, so it's quite hard to get all of the team around it, so we've made that element of it much bigger. Um, and then you, you can see here we've developed the game counters and um, the general aesthetic and the production value has gone up. And, and actually what I worked with Tara when we were thinking about it was trying to trying to um, underpin the emotional tug for the audience. And actually um, what we ended up doing was, um, you know, start get, sending Tara off down a road where she was exploring the lives of the animals of this island and the, uh, the animals coming to life around the island as opposed to a character who was slightly more, you know, slightly harder to, to, to imagine, although, you know, you can see that the children did imagine or uh, relate to, um, the, these, these animals started appearing around the school. So they, 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 began, they be, now begin to save these animals and there's evidence of these animals escaping from the island. Um, so it, it, again, I, I, you know, we'll forward on the, the info about this project um, and, um, you, you can have a look about how it's developed. We're, we're often we're housing a few Instagram lives at points to introduce people to it. Um, so do do sign up to our mailing list and um, and follow us on on all the socials. Um, but yeah, no, it really was very very interesting and quite scary as a company to to be piloting something when it wasn't quite right or quite ready. But actually, that's something we're taking forward um, because you, we usually we kind of squirrel away and hide away and don't actually reveal anything until the um until we're ready to present and actually i think that the idea of doing iterations and and, and working directly with our client you know not our clients but our audience it, it, it is very very beneficial so the immersive learning collective have kind of really helped shape this project in terms of what it's become and I, I won't, I, you know, spend time on it. I put it up, and people can can have a read of this. But just to say that one of the things that we um, are looking at is this idea of playful pedagogies. And um, I think Pete, we were talking yesterday, weren't we, about how actually play was a kind of new way of, sort of conceptually a, a useful way of framing some of the work that's going on um, in in schools. Um, and actually what this project did is, is provide space for play, for teachers to play with each other in the inset sessions and in the in immersive learning collective sessions, um, but also to bring that playfulness into, into classrooms as well. Um, I won't read these now, um, but people can, can have a look, but these are just some, you know, just, just some, uh, a few examples of teachers thinking about how um, the idea of playfulness, not only just gameplay, but also the playful, you know in, enabling children to play with objects and, and and let ideas emerge really came out um at the end of the the uh the last actually in you know in person immersive learning collective um the artists asked teachers to put in a uh, a luggage tag into a uh, a suitcase with what they were going to take into the next year and uh, like you know typical kind of uh, punch drunk enrichment style where they came up with a ritual um, so they all placed it inside or touched the case and uh, came up with their own ritual, closed the case, our ideas don't go to waste, long may it last. And now, of course, we have the you know, privilege of continuing to work with these schools after the first year to see how they develop. And um, Pete, I'll just leave you, um, I think, to you know, kind of close on our reflections of the journey so far, um, because we are looking back, but we're also looking forward, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Angela. So, um, yeah, oh, you can see the sort of stages we're going through in terms of the three year um, uh, program. So principles this year, it's it's co-design. So and actually, um, in terms of co-design, we're looking at really the fusion of what the teachers already know um, and what they've learned from us and actually them bringing their curriculum and um, school needs to the table. Um, and we're very much focusing this year on actually just beginning to design projects. Um, and um, I think the designing of those projects and the gestations of those projects are then gonna lead into year three where we're gonna coach schools into independent design. 
And the idea being that they really take on the mantle of creative. Um, that's the dream world. Um, and some of them already doing that, but so that they then we, we essentially will end up with at least 17 immersive projects fully authored and masterminded really by teachers and by schools and doing uh, and applying to areas of school where, where it's needed most. So, and this year we're doing, we've got to focus on early years foundation stage. So we're creating a project for that um, age range, which is, um, you know, the very beginning of school life, which is very, very important actually um, this year because they're, they're an age group which have been impacted really heavily by COVID in terms of their ability to be able to interact and to be able to be in nursery settings and to be able to do all of those de developmental things. So I think we're, uh, you know, not by design, um, actually, but um, I, I hope, but certainly I think it will be useful is that we're, we're well placed this year to create something which we hope will, hope will help that age group both now and into the future. So we're actually co-designing that project. We start with a blank page, we start with a group of teachers and we're, we're now a in a process where we're r and a very small element of what might become a future project with that team of teachers and using what we find out there to develop uh, and co-design a brand new project which will be released next summer. Um, so uh, we, we had obviously had COVID and um, we had a year where we paused the collective in some respects, but we created something called year 1.5 and actually during that time we created something called the Moon Juice Collection, which was a collection of teacher-led resources that if teachers felt they could and they had the time and they wanted to, they could continue this practice and they could um, and deliver these projects. Uh, and we adapted that so that it could be um, done in real life and also done as a hybrid version across, um, across uh, you know, across, you know, um, home learning and, and in classroom teaching. So we're hugely excited. And actually, for me, one of the things I really want to do, and I haven't really spoken to Angela about this, but an outcome I want in year four, post year three, is to work with this collaborative and to, to design something called the immersive curriculum. So to see how much of the curriculum we can tackle and how and to get a, a bunch of projects which we can then launch as an initiative which um, more teachers can sign up to. Um, uh, and so we're, we're thinking about how this network extends beyond three years and how we can both make that manageable and um, accessible and useful for a much broader range of teachers in the UK and beyond. Mm. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. And I think we'll, we'll leave it there for questions. So we have quite time for questions. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. But yeah, very much looking looking forward to the next year of co-design um, with the, with our teachers. Thanks, Thanks Angela and Peter. And I mean, when I talk to people, I often say to them, when they ask me about what I'm interested in academically, I often say it's a bit of a triangle between transformative pedagogy, uh, the arts and technology. So this was my dream seminar. It was amazing. So thank you so much for this work. I think it's got so many possibility. My, the synapses in my brain are kind of exploding with um, possibility. Uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, just pop it in the chat or put your hand up, um, uh, use that icon. Um, and I, I want to ask a question, which is really about uh, how this work differs or resonates with, um, and I, I don't even know if you know of Cecily O'Neill's work, Angela and Peter, but that uses a lot of deep kind of pretext. Um, certainly, I mean, you would have read it, Angela, in some of the stuff that John Carroll wrote, but to how do you see it differentiating or being similar to that work and any process drama in general? Yeah, Andrew, so, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm okay, not, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, thank I'm you, Pete. Um, so in terms of... Um, it's an interesting one because, like you say, there are so many strands. So there's, there's the strand about sort of technology and this idea, um, you know, in terms of Carol's work with you know, this digital pretext. You know, you do have there was this example there of having the kind of website, someone you're talking to outside of the school that teachers really kind of um, saw that as a powerful kind of uh, tool using this this idea. But I suppose what's different here as well. Um, is the distributed nature of that and the transformation of spaces um, and the way that actually this idea of um, the pretext or the purpose it evolves over time um, and uh, 
one of the things um, that, uh, particularly with this code name um, Atlantis, was about uh, the way that the spaces were telling the stories um, was important, but also um, uh, in terms of the way that I suppose it's sort of in terms of the school community as well, in terms of the way it was sort of supported by, by sort of senior leadership involvement uh, and, and, other, and other teachers as, and, and other sort of partners as well, to keep that uh, going, to kind of hold that free to, so to, to hold the kind of narrative together um, was, was important. So I don't know if it answers the question, if it doesn't, please do push me a little uh, further there, um, Michael, but I, I think to do with the way the space works. And, hmm. Sorry, you finish, Angela. Um, yes, so that, that was important. And, and also um, in terms of the, the gaming principles as well, which is something I'm very interested in as well. Um, the, the, the idea that this ultimately was a game with stages and it was kind of iterative and it, it wasn't uh, in terms of process drama, you know, it, 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 it wasn't that you could go anywhere. It did, it did have a pathway. It's just it had, um, it had, it had pockets by which, you know, there were this kind of explore, exploratory work with teachers and children. Um, so it was, yeah, it was interesting. I'm not sure I can I've summarise that particularly well, but uh, hopefully I will in writing. <laughs> no, I suppose yeah. I'm just, I'm looking at it quite quickly, actually. And you know, I think, I think there's a huge similarity actually in terms of the, 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 the teacher and the um, uh, pupils taking on role. I suppose where, where, where we, with the work like Codename, and I think actually if teachers take this work on themselves then it might could go in that direction because they could be very you know they could be very improvisational um, about it but I think for us we're we kind of provide the backbone in the architecture which is quite set in terms of the narrative arc so we're always trying to make sure that um, you know we reach that resolution and that we give that theatrical climax so it's kind of a crafted piece of theatre which you give the tools to deliver um, and and then and then and then it plays out so it's quite prescriptive in that sense but it is about um, the, the the pupils and the teachers embodying that story and the teachers yeah. very much kind of bringing that story to life and taking pupils on that journey but I mean it, the, we don't and maybe we'll do this with early years foundation stage and so we don't have it, the sort of journey is set so although there is a sense of agency, there's not the ability for it to take it down um, a different pathway, although it would be good if it could. <laughs> it's just, try, yeah. And like, so, and like uh, you say, uh, actually, some yeah, of the work sorry. we're doing with early years, this, this, this term actually is quite, uh, is quite open. So we'll see where that goes, it'd be interesting. Mm. Yeah, so it's more theatrical in the sense that, you know, if you go to a show, Although it's not true of Punch Trunk all the time, actually, I was just thinking, if you go to a show, you, you do have a predetermined outcome. I mean, Death of a Salesman always ends the same way. Um, although the way in immersive work, obviously, there's multiple interpretations and experiences. Um, but I suppose you're always seeing a version of the same show. And I, and I, it, so I, 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 it's just a, an interesting kind of relationship, I think. And a lot... I can see a lot of really productive discussion around kind of the resonances and differences in there and maybe a hybridised engagement to, to do what you're suggesting, Peter, I think, which is to open up the agency. And there's a lot written about that in applied and in, um, in drama work, as I'm sure you know, Angela. So I think that's a, it's kind of fascinating, actually. Think. And I think that is certainly something that we're, you know, is interesting in terms of teacher pedagogy, which is, you know, as I was saying earlier, in terms of learning, looking for that, you know, the seizing the moment uh, to write or finding those kind of moments um, was very important. And, you know, um, and, and uh, it, it does depend as well about um, what, what types of planning and what practices are kind of um, valued and supported within schools. That is important. Um, so, you know, sort of school um environments you know uh, and you know the uh, are very important because actually uh you know sometimes planning has to be quite you know it's, it, it, you know you do need this uh, you know outcomes we do we do live in that kind of culture where we have this kind of performativity um aspect of things so it's it's an interesting is there's a tension but i think it's something that is um being explored in this in this project and i think we'll have some really interesting um findings at the end of the three years
Yeah, and I think um, seeing there's uh, no questions, I'll just keep kind of musing here, um, not because I have to, but because I'm fascinated. I think the other thing that you've picked up, which is really um, critical, is the affect and how the affecting you engage with the affect. And I think that's, you were mentioning, you know, the things that are important in pedagogy. I think that's been really underrated uh, in pedagogical work over the years. And I, I wonder whether this is a glimpse of what might be possible in classrooms if we actually paid attention to the affect. And I love the way you've put that in your structure kind of centrally as a as an experiential kind of feature, I suppose, for want of a better word. Um, so yeah, that's fascinating. And I think you're right. And, and this, uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, drawing on as well, building on work by colleagues at the University of Sheffield as well, Bernard et al, who have done um, also looking into work about uh, immersive theatre practices and, um, uh, and integration of technology. So you might be interested in their work too. Um, but they are, one of the things that uh, we're looking at is about, yeah, what, uh, and also, um, there's work uh, again being undertaken um, by Liz uh, Chesworth as well, thinking about what do teachers notice. So there are things that you might notice about, um, you know, engagement with the curriculum. You might notice that, or you might notice what what children are bringing in, their cultural connections that they're making, or you might notice how the environment is actually affecting their learning and they're interacting and noticing and it's actually kind of an agent in and of itself you know the way that the space is set up so there are all those kind of ways of looking which i think are really important and i think part of what i'm trying to do with this model here and why i think it's important when understanding punch truck enrichment's work is that effective engagement actually intersects and inflects with what you observe uh you know in terms of you know um what emerges in terms of children kind of being you know wanting to write needing to write or feeling the urgency needed to to solve a problem that sort of urgency might inflect with that or the sense of community the affective sense of belonging and being needed in a task might um imp impact on the effect that you observe on um on their identities as a learner or the place that they take within the classroom maybe they speak out for the first time that term you know because they feel like they are responsible and they're needed. So there's all these kind of ways that they, they intersect and inflect. And it's not like another one makes that happen, but what I'm trying to do is unpick it, I suppose. And, and I think that's really important with this kind of work. And um, I'm really interested, Peter, let's, let's talk, talk as well about this, you know, how, what this looks like in terms of curriculum design. Um, how do we start to notice? How do we value? Oh, that's great. Uh, Peter, did you want to have a last word before we sign off for the morning slash evening? Yeah, I think um, I think in terms of the work we're doing with Angela and that we have done with Angela over the years, I, I think the the Oracles project, the cross platform one, was pretty key. Actually, we you know I went into it going like we need to do some kind of research around this. I we don't really know what this project is. In, in the truth, we're kind of not making it up as we go along, but it was sort of. Um, you're not quite sure how it's going to be received. You're not quite sure how it's going to what the, what the you know the object was. And I was also conscious that a lot of work we'd been doing at the time around evaluation was very focused on attainment in literacy. Um, and we'd be so we were quite focused on like school measures and 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 actually the what we were getting was was good, but it wasn't great. And actually, what we hadn't been able to do really was to understand the practice. So actually, giving Angela you know partly free reign to observe this process in action and to observe all elements of this project actually led us to thinking about our work as playful and as you know imaginative play as Im as immersive play and actually you know really what we're doing there and what we're doing um with other evaluation work we're doing is trying to get to the source of what the impact of this work is and then from that extrapolate outwards and say okay so how does that best benefit teacher practice what you know and actually in turn we, we, we look at it now with our evaluation model for a current another three-year project we're doing around the three p's so positivity possibility and purpose and we're really looking with schools longitudinally to and looking at and working with schools in quite a focused and um a collaborative way to go okay so how do you what change do you see this happening in happening in your school what change do you want to see in your school and let's let's measure these three p's against it um and let's look at that engagement with practice over time and let's do it in a strategic way and and so we're really 
I think we're stripping back quite a lot and going back to the source of what our practice is, both to look at it in terms of teacher practice and then also to look at it in terms of long term engaged practice, ideally into the future, really trying to make a, a really strong case and a really solid platform for advocating for this type of practice as something which isn't on the you know edges of, you know, forward thinking progressive schools, but is actually forms part of a core understanding of when you create experience like this, um, how impactful that can be for pupils and how, when you really think about engagement, you know, when we talk about engagement, we're talking about a positive attitude towards learning, okay. coming to school, high attendance. When we, when we look at possibility, we're looking at imagination. We're not looking at you know, just writing, we're looking at the ability to imagine your own future. Um, um, and I think imagination is hugely underrated in schools. And I think in terms of purpose, there's so much about intent in education in the UK at the moment. Why are we learning this and why are we doing this? Um, you know, what, but really we've got to look at trying to frame um, creatively for pupils. And when you do it properly and you go, go you, there's a real reason why you're doing this and it's framed within a, um, a creative and a narrative construct you get massively brilliant engagement and you get, you get, it doesn't matter whether or not that child then writes a A star piece of work. What matters to me is that they see the value of doing it. They understand the value of doing it. And, and then really that's about audience positioning. That is about putting the, the audience, your pupils, your teachers at the center of this experience, which, um, and, 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 and making sure they understand that and, and, and in understanding it really, you know, tapping into this innate sense of playing children, um, and 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 you know. So anyway, there's, I could go off on all sorts of. I just, I think that's absolutely, absolutely core. And I think you know, um, Salen and Zimmerman talk about sort of games, you know, and, and play, sort of talking about actually there are these structures and frameworks which sh which create these spaces of possibility. And I think that's what um, Punch Drunk, you, you know, what your what, what your work does is it creates these spaces of possibility. Um, and like as you say, you know, you, this purpose. Uh, you know, this, this kind of overlay of purpose, this imaginative and creative um, drive that comes behind your work um, is, 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 is really key. So yeah, this idea of play, these playful pedagogies is something that's really gonna um, kind of come out, I think, during this, this, this project and, and we're defining it with teachers, with punch drunk as we go along, so. Um, yeah, and, uh, and what we and find with parents is parents are really important. Actually, what we find is that parents are, Parents are really interested in this work because their pupils are interested in this work. For anybody who's got children at school, often they don't want to talk about school at the end of the day. But what we are hearing is that pupils are going home and writing and parents are noticing and we try and invite parents into the project. Our challenge as ever is to make sure that um, we, and we're working on this communication wise to um, make sure that we can openly communicate who we are so we engage parents about debunking the myth, as it were, so that um, pupils uh, enter into the magic of it but um and are able yeah, there was to an interesting kind of that. ethics thing in, in the ethics process again because sort of, this is all reviewed sort of through the Roehampton ethics board all the research but yes we had to find a way didn't we of getting the letter to parents but that wouldn't this, yeah it was interesting uh, yes, kind of yeah. letting them in but without spoiling kind of the magic of, of the uh, of the experience for the children yeah letters yeah. home look it's it's been a wonderful wonderful webinar thank you both for your time i mean Create has really been established to understand the linkages between the arts, uh, education, health, well-being, uh, and research. And you've really been a, a fabulous exemplar for us tonight. I really can't wait to see where this work goes. Um, I'm kind of sitting here half in wonder, half in jealousy, wishing we were doing uh, this kind of work over here. So I can't can't wait till you send a boatload of punch trunk um, immersive educators over here to work with. I'd love to work with them. Um, I'm going to tell you one. You've got you've got two very engaged practitioners in Australia at the moment in imaginary theatre. Tom Browning and Fiona McDonald. There is a set of the Lost Ending Library, which is in a container. Uh, yes. on the gold coast um okay. and i know they're really they're ready to get it out of bed <laughs> um so if you can if you can work with that ours and that team over there we can we can we could we can continue it's it um this work so that is a possibility don't worry i'll follow that up peter angela okay, peter thanks so much for your time tonight thanks everyone who attended
Uh, I hope this is the start of some really exciting opportunities in all sorts of places. And thanks for doing such wonderful work and sharing with us it, with us tonight. Thank you for thanks having for us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.